Stan Gibalisco here, proprietor and operator of amateur radio station W1GV, Whiskey One Good Vibrations, with just a little reminiscing back about, oh, uh, about 40 years ago now, I guess it would be, uh, 1967. Oh my, oh my, it'd be longer than that. It would be it would be 50 years ago. I was licensed in 1966 as WN0OKV, Ocean Kilo Victor, <clears throat> in Rochester, Minnesota. And in and at that time the novice class license was only for 1 year and you could not renew it, so you either had to upgrade or that was the end of your ham radio experience. Well, I upgraded, of course, to the general class license, which at that time carried all amateur privileges. Uh, before the, That was before they even started uh, incentive licensing, I believe. And so, and it also allowed you to use a VFO, variable frequency oscillator, rather than crystal control. And my transmitter was a Viking Adventurer, Johnson Viking Adventurer transmitter. The receiver was a Halicrafters SX-130, Sierra X-Ray 130, shortwave radio. And I just trusted those crystals to be accurate in their frequency when I was a novice. And my first operating frequency was 7,185 kilocycles, which in that time was in the novice portion of the 40-meter band. Well, when I upgraded to general, of course, and, and got the privilege of using a variable frequency oscillator, I, of course, wanted to be able to, to roam the band instead of just be locked into one frequency, so I got a night kit um, variable frequency oscillator, but it was already built. It was, I believe I shopped at Electronics Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota at that time and found a, uh, a VFO called a night, I don't know what the model number was, but uh, I don't believe that it had a provision for keying or if it did, it didn't result in a very good signal, one or the other. But it was a, an oscillator that just had to run continuously. And uh, you would plug that oscillator into the crystal socket or t into a special VFO socket that looked just like the crystal socket and was right next to it in the Viking Adventurer transmitter. 50 watts plate power input. Um, so about probably about 25 watts RF output uh, is what it would produce. Um, well, I hooked that VFO up to and plugged it into the VFO socket in the transmitter, and I keyed the transmitter just as I had uh, when I used the crystal. But for some reason, uh, there was a always the the oscillator was always running so i was cathode keying one of the amplifiers in the transmitter i'm not sure which one but it was enough to put a pretty sharp voltage on that little old brass pounder that i had that uh radio shack cw hand key and uh, but when the key was up the VFO was always running, and so it produced a signal that encountered an amplifier whose cathode was disconnected from ground, and so it, it couldn't radiate very much signal out over the air, only a few milliwatts probably, if that. But it radiated enough signal out over the air so that I had to do two things. I had to have a separate antenna for the receiver a separate uh, shortwave antenna for the receiver and a 40 meter dipole antenna 
fed with RG8U coax for the transmitter. And they were pretty close to each other, these two antennas. And that VFO signal was loud enough to overwhelm the SX-130 receiver and prevent me from hearing anything unless I shut that VFO off while I was receiving. So that's what I did. I had a switch, and I remember my operating table was a door, an actual door, varnished and very nice, set up on concrete blocks, very nice, sturdy table. And then the door has, you know, that little hole for the knob. And I found a switch that just fit that hole, an ordinary light switch, uh, like you would use in the, in the, the wall, a wall switch. But it was round, and it fit in that hole. And I would literally cut the power to the VFO when I wanted to hear anything. And then when I was ready to transmit, I'd flip that switch back on, and turn the VFO back on and of course I would always hear a signal whether I, the key was down or not in my receiver so I couldn't have full break-in I had to have manual transmit receive control that signal when the key was up in the Viking Adventurer transmitter is what is known as a back wave they call that backwave radiation and it's a real relic it, it ought to mark me as a real old timer because even in that day most transceivers that you would purchase uh, uh, for use on the air none of them would would have anything like that had an arrangement that was as primitive as that but I uh, as I recall I preferred for some reason not to key the oscillator either because it couldn't be done it had to be shut on and off and didn't result in a good signal or else uh, didn't have a key jack I don't recall which but I had to I decided that I wanted that VFO to run continuously and I would key the amplifier uh, thereby either amplifying the signal to a full 50 watts or letting a little tiny bit of VFO signal leak out over the air I never knew how much. Not enough ever to get me an official observer report, an OO report, so I guess it must not have been enough to, to be heard for any great distance, maybe a mile or two. But in any case, that is a back wave. And if you ever hear the term back wave radiation in a ham radio uh, transmitter, that's what it means. It means that the oscillator is running on the frequency that you intend to transmit on and therefore produces a very tiny signal on the frequency uh, that you intend to use but you only get the real signal the real the big kahuna all 50 watts of it when you press that brass pounder down and connect the cathode of the amplifier to ground letting it amplify uh, I remember that uh, oscillator had a little bit of a drift problem uh, and uh, I couldn't really, I never occurred to me to leave it running 24-7 except when I was receiving. Uh, it just never occurred to me to let that thing constantly run, maybe warming it up and to its stabilization temperature. I was just, you know, I was only 13 years old. What do you expect out of a 13-year-old kid uh, operating uh, in the 1960s? But that, that, the term backwave dates all the way back to the 1920s. I, I looked it up on the Internet. You ought to try that. Google on backwave, and, well, you'll get other terms, too, that have nothing to do with ham radio. But, but I believe that um, Hiram... Maxim himself, the original W1AW uh, licensee, wrote about backwave radiation and how to eliminate it way back in 1920 or thereabouts, then about. So I was a little kid operating an old-time radio in a real old-timer fashion. And... Uh, 
the, the neatest thing about it was that the hole in that door exactly fit my transmit receive switch. So I had been done receiving, flipped that switch in the door, the back wave comes on, and then I transmit, and I hear my signal as a continuous tone, whether the key is down or not. So I just just sent along, uh, knowing when the key was down, I could feel it. Oh, that was the old timer, a 13-year-old old timer. But they, they've always said, people have always told me I was like an old man ever since I was born. God knows I sure am like an old man today, but no back wave radiation comes out of my radio these days. Stan Jubilisco, signing off. Proprietor and operator of Amateur Radio Station. Now, W1GV, then WA0OKV. Same guy, different radios. Until next time, 73 and so long, which, even with a back wave on your transmitter, translates over the air to da-da-da-da-da-da.